Jai Prabhuji. In our class today, we will talk about the Atma Vicharana, which is the inquiry into the self and is most recognized with the question of who am I? Vicharana means investigation and Atma Vicharana is the specific inquiry into the self. It's the search for the self or the quest for what is real and eternal. And this is the main question that Advaita Vedanta is dealing with. Who am I? We speak a lot about this egoic entity with our uh, egoic image. And now we are trying to recognize what is true in us or what is real in us or what is the self slash where is the self. But before we go deeper into this uh, question and to talk about the, the self and what we are not experiencing at the moment, let's examine our experience now. So each one of us go with a deep sensation of an I, that I exist, and it's a very deep notion that I exist and I am at the center of everything that is happening. So the false identification make us believe that we are in the center of the world and everything happens around us and everything happens to me. Also in this experience, there is me, there is you, we are separated. And not only that I'm separated from you, I'm also separated from everything that are, is around me. So there is a very deep notion of separation. If we meet someone, I can tell him, oh, my name is Indra, my name is John, I'm Rachel, etc. But this is information about a name that I was given, right? The name that we were given by our parents. And it says nothing about who I really am. I can also say that I'm American, Chinese, Israeli. This is information about my, the geographical area that I was born in or where I live. But it doesn't tell anything about who I really am or what I really am. Uh, the same applies that if we say our profession, I can say that I'm a doctor, I'm a singer, a teacher. This information about my profession just describes what I'm doing in life, but says nothing about who I really am. So when we meet someone, we can really describe all these attributes. We can answer all the questions of what is your name, where do you live, what do you do for a living, etc. But it's all information that still stays on the surface, doesn't touch our depths. And funny enough, we feel that we know someone by knowing this information about him. Many times we say, oh, I know this person, he lives, there. He lives in this street, his profession is like that. And not only that, we form an image about the person by knowing only this external information about him. But we feel that we know him. Is this to know someone? It is not. Let's read a quote from Prabhuji. It is important to understand that the ego, or what we believe ourselves to be, is a foreign idea about ourselves that we adapted as our own. We all know that our parents gave us our name. Someone told us that we are cute. We are nice, we're beautiful, smart, but also that we are annoying, not lovable, stupid, and so and forth. We go in life and start adapting different perceptions that people 
had about us. We believed what people told us about ourselves. So all of our knowledge about ourselves also comes from external sources. So the first step was to believe and to adapt all these perceptions or descriptions that people uh, said about me and I adapted it as my personality. And we go in life with this personality. We believe that this is who we really are. Where we can barely differentiate between what we were told about ourselves or who am I really? All I know, all that I know about myself is this identification that I adapted. And it's a very important uh, point here because it's an, we adapted it to ourselves. It's not something that we discovered. It's not something that we know about our depth and about who I really am. Didn't you see people that uh, after doing something for a long time or they did something that they consider that they love, suddenly they start thinking and asking themselves, do I really love to sing or do I really love to write or do I really love to be a teacher or was it because, you know, that my parents wanted me to adapt this profession? And I saw people that after doing this for many years decided to stop and decided to take a break and really discover what they really want to do or what they really like to do. So sometimes we can go a, a lifetime following what everybody wanted or wants from us, fulfilling someone else's expectations. And when we sit and ask, what do I really want? We, sp we stay speechless. We stay with open mouth. We don't know what to say. And suddenly the ground beneath us starts to shake. It's a point that many reach at a certain time in their life. And we go on with this egoic identification. We think that this is what I like, this is what I don't like, this is what I am, and this is what I want, this is what I don't want, this is what I believe in, this is what I don't believe in. I am this and I am that. And all day long, every second of the day, we are around this idea of I. That in a way, we, we already accept it as a fact. Not many stop and ask who I really am. We already accept it as a fact that I am like this or I'm like that. I love this and I don't love something else. And here comes a question of who am I? And we kind of feel lost. What do you mean who am I? This is the first time that someone make us doubt that maybe what I consider myself to be, it is not what I really am. But there is a process or a way to go there because since we are so identified with this egoic identity that we cannot see in the beginning anything else beyond it. All we see is basically all that we are familiar with or everything that we are used to, everything that we feel. It's everything around this eye that just we follow, we can say with the closed eyes. And suddenly when someone comes, we come in a meeting with the um, question, who am I? And we don't know what to do. We feel like we are lost. 
And as Prabhuji calls it, it's an expression of the most elevated and noble rebellion. And why does Prabhuji choose to use the word rebellion? If we understand that the I that I consider myself to be now is basically information that I receive from the outside, from my parents, from my neighbor, from society, from my friends, everything that I adapted to myself. This is the first time that I say, okay, let's take a pause. I want to check who I really am and stop following or stop living by everything that I was told about myself. And this is what it's a rebellious act. We can go on in life, not asking this question, just follow what people expect from us. And we can lose this precious lifetime opportunity without realizing who we are or even without asking. And Babuji says that this question restores our dignity as we accept ourselves as the sole authority on ourselves and what we are. I stop accepting the authority of the society. I start taking myself as the authority on myself. And it's rebellious, we can say it's courageous, in a way, it's to tell society that I'm not listening to what you told me anymore. I want to check really who am I or what do I really like? What do I really want? All these identifications or all these, we can say, characteristics or attributes that I consider so much myself to be them, I take, a, I take a break and I said, okay, let's start searching or looking for what is really me. So we can say that Atma Vicharana reaches the highest of its expression with the question of who am I? It is highly significant because for the first time, Babuji says, we relinquish other people, neighbors, and everything external as sources of information about who we are. And if we think about it for a moment, what makes us quest or what makes us question? If we blindly following something every second of our lives, what suddenly makes us quest or what can make us follow this question? So we know that interest is a reason or a motive that makes us a quest or question wonder, curiosity, desire to know. We can say even that kids, you know, when we see kids, we can, we can see that they're curious and they're asking questions that we don't really know how to answer, right? Many times the people say, oh, they ask what we consider the obvious. And suddenly when the kids comes to us with a question, we don't know what to say because we are like, oh, I didn't even take the time to think about it. I didn't even pay attention that it is such a crucial or important question. And each one of us can see on his own that as kids, we didn't accept that this is how it is or when we ask something that the parents didn't know how to answer us or the, the teachers and they told us, oh, this is how it is, that's it. We didn't accept it in the beginning. But with the time, 
you know, when we see time after time that our, our questions uh, are not being answered and or kind of like dismissed, uh, we stop asking. We stop asking. We shut uh, down the kid in us. Imagine, imagine for a moment if we bring here a creature that never saw us and never saw our world and the way of our living. Imagine how many questions he, this creature will ask. What is this and why it's like that? And there will be so many questions that we never paid attention to. And then, okay, we don't know what to say, we're speechless. So with the time, curiosity fades. And we start to get accustomed to the way of living without wonder or without curiosity by our society. Stop wondering about life, get a profession, and not only the profession that you think about, get a good profession that you can make a living, uh, be respected, etc. Live a decent kind of life. And I know many people that they have big dreams or big expectations from themselves or big things that they wanted to do. But with the time, the fire in them were put out but by all this unacceptance of our surrounding. And it doesn't have to be always unaccepting. It can be just that people didn't really see the importance of giving us the option to find in ourselves what we really want and what we will, what is our purpose in life like the the conditions were not there and we just started doing what is expected from us and stop going after our dreams be productive and this is life. This is how it is. Many of us were told that, you know, finish high school, go to the university, make a family, bring children to the world, and this is how you get older, and that's the way of the world. Some of us didn't agree with that, but most of people, this is the education that they were given. So we are so used to a feedback from our society, we also get addicted to, the, to this feedback. We get addicted to our parents' applauses when we do something good or nice, and we get like a further apart from who we really are, because we are basing my behavior on the feedback that I will receive and it's getting more and more in my, as my second nature just sometimes to do something so other people will feel good with me not because I really want to or to please people so not only that we not only that we were people expected things from us, if we failed, we will feel also guilt. We will feel that, oh, I didn't succeed in my mission. But as an adult, I'm sure that each one of us can ask himself and see, did I really come to this world to please other people? Am I really here just to continue what my parents did and their way of life. And then we meet a spiritual master or we read in a, a spiritual book about Atma Vicharana, it, about the inquiry into the self. And we have no idea where or what to look for. 
We hear that all this image and entity that was built by Ador is illusory and not our true self. We hear it, we understand it, we know it intellectually. And, but we don't really know where to start our search. We don't really know where to go. Even if I make the effort and try to look within myself, all I see is these identifications or characteristic attributes, patterns, that this is all I know about myself. So even if I'm trying to make the effort, all I see is what I'm used to and what is really me. And here comes the negation process of what is called neti neti, nor this, nor that. It's a process that once you start follow, you start realizing all the faults in you. So what is this neti neti that the path, that this path is using and taking it as a practice? It's a negation process that tells us or give us the ability for the first time or give us the option for the first time to look within ourselves and say, okay, this is not me and that is not me and this is not me and by negating anything that is not me, we are making way for the revelation of the self. I want to read what Prabhuji writes about the neti neti process. It is a destructive process in the sense that it makes use of negation, neti neti, or not this, not that. This process goes on negating whatever is illusory and false in us until all we are left with is what we really are. Pure Consciousness, Sad Chid Ananda. In dismissing what we are not, we strip of ourselves of all false identification. Okay, so we will go over what Prabhuji writes and try to analyze it. We understand that it's a negation process, that it's destructive. And destructive to whom? It is destructive to this egoic, illusory identity. Because the neti neti comes to strip us from everything that we think that we know about ourselves, everything that we were told about ourselves, everything that we think that we are, it takes us to a process that we can see what is false in us. Now, if it was, let's say, um, the easy way, once we are told, okay, there is a false identification and there is the self, which is the real in you, we will be able just to experience it and all this egoic, illusory identity will dissolve. In reality, the process is not that simple. I will not say it's not a matter of easy or hard. It's a matter of not that simple because at the moment for us in our reality all we experience all that we feel is like layers and layers and layers and layers that we covered ourselves with so in order to 
strip ourselves from all these identifications, we need to, um, I don't want to say get rid, but we need to uh, dissolve many layers in us and many incarnations of living by false identity. And Prabhuji said, we negate, we negate what we are in order to be the self. Once the covering will move aside, the self will have the place or the ground to manifest. It needs ground. <laughs> it needs a certain fertile ground, ground that it can express itself, that it can be realized. There is a way that we can practically practice the neti neti process. If we go to the beginning, we said that this I that I'm basing all my life on, or this I that I believe that is me and I follow what I like and what I don't like, Take, take a moment that you have a conflict with someone, for example, and you're in disagreement and you get hurt. There is a way where you can ask yourself, okay, so who did get hurt? If you check, you will see that this egoic phenomena got hurt, not what you really are. And by doing this, the tension between the two people can really be dismissed because when, if, you, if you really want to work on yourself, of course, if you really want to go in the retro-progressive yoga and discover who you are and try not to follow this identification so much and I would say not even not to follow but we are trying to create more distance from us and this egoic phenomena there are many situations during the day that you can practice and bring into action and this is one of it but it's not only when you get hurt, it's also when people tell you how great you are and wonderful and you feel, oh, so proud, I'm satisfied. You can think for a second and say, am I really satisfied? And who is satisfied? This ego that I'm feeding with the feedback of other people about me. So, no, this is not the direction. And with taking different uh, situations in life, you can practice this neti neti, I would say, in the first steps. Yeah, because neti neti is a much uh, deeper uh, process that we can take. But I'm just saying for someone who is just starting his development uh, process, you can see many times during the day what is feeding you? What is feeding your ego? And what gives you pleasure? And what doesn't? And when we are confronting someone else, does it really mean that he doesn't understand you? Or he just, or is it that he just doesn't follow the way that you think that things should be? Because my ego is very present, is very stubborn, and I want things to go my, oh, my way. So there are many situations that we can stop for a moment and ask and see who is this phenomena or who is this thing that got hurt? Who is this thing that feel uh, diminished? And who is this that feels so proud? And you can find many, many times of the day how you are just accumulating more and more proudness of yourself or you are feeding your ego in a way that doesn't help you in the development process because in the retro-progressive path 
We are not saying that you will wake up tomorrow and the ego will disappear. Eventually, there is not even, like the, the notion that we feel now that the ego is very present and very solid is not even that. It's not solid and there is nothing to overcome. But I, I will not get to it at, the, at, the, at this lecture. But in the beginning, you can check yourself and do a home check and see where did I feed my ego, where I'm trying to control other people, and to recognize more this egoic entity or this illusion and start saying, okay, this is my ego, we can say, but this is not the real me. This is not the self. And if we look for a moment, the, this I is the basic ground for any thought. I like, I don't like. I believe, I don't believe. I hate, I love. If we're for a moment trying to take this I you will see that the thoughts cannot exist because there is no ground where they can exist. So this I is the basis of the mind. It's like the, the, where all other thoughts, feelings and emotions live. And once we start going in our develop a, in the process of development we we can see that this i that we are basing everything on is not really something that you can really trust or it's not so solid as it feels and when we come to the question who am i which I are we referring to? So we understand that this I is, I is at the basis of any thought. And if we go back to the beginning of the class, when we say our name, our profession, our address, etc., we can stop and ask. When I say I am Indra, I live in New York, I'm American, there are certain attributes that I added to I. I am this. I am that. If we take the I, we will see that there is really the other information is irrelevant. Like it doesn't have any solid existence. And when we walk in the path of realizing who we are or realizing the self, we sometimes can get confused because who is this I? Which I am I referring to? And here comes what Prabhuji says. While the question about what we are is born in the intellect, the answer is found in the silence of meditation. It is existential. It is not something to describe but to be. The correct response consists of simply being one, what one is. There is no need to transform oneself into something else, but only to be what we are, what we have always been, and what we cannot stop being. It is written so beautifully and if we take it to our experience, when we start asking who am I, this confusion that can come up and we can say, hold, who is asking? Is it me asking who am I? Is it coming from some 
a calling, Pabuji clarifies to us that the question is born in the intellect. Yeah, it is true. In the beginning, the same egoic entity that we want to overcome, we can say, this is the entity that is asking, who am I? So it starts in the intellect, but the answer is found in the silence of meditation. That's what Prabhuji is telling us. And what are we doing in meditation? In meditation, we are creating a distance between ourselves and the thoughts, ourselves and the feelings, ourselves and the notions. So in the process of meditation, we are trying to be in a place where no external voices are taking place or we stop following the, what, do, what we see on the external in order to look into the internal. So, in the meditation and in this process, Prabhuji says that it's existential. It is not something to describe but to be. And it's to be something that we were always were. It's not that what we think that when we start to question, who am I? So I'm starting to look outside of me or in the external world or in the objective. We are, because the way we are trained and used and uh, educated, we are trying to find an answer in the objective world. When the answer is in the depth of meditation, it will not be that we will go somewhere or read about something, know some, learn new things, and then we can say, oh, this is me or this is the self. No, it's a evolutionary process that goes back to what we were from the first moment of our being. And Prabhuji even mentioned that there is no need to transform oneself to something else. We only need to be what we have been and what we are. And even more than that, what we cannot stop being. Even now, when we sit in front of each other, we are always in the self. We are always in our true nature. But it, I mean, our true nature is not affected by all the covering that were put on us. So, we think that maybe one day I will wake up different, the ego will vanish, the ego will disappear, and then I will uh, have something that I don't have at the moment. But with the self, it is not that we will add something to ourselves. It is not that we will find something that we were, we, we are missing it at the moment, but I mean, we will not, it will not be something that will add, we will, we will add it to us. And this is very important because many times we go with this feeling even, okay, so now I will meditate something will happen, and again, when I'm expecting that this something will happen, I'm expecting it from the outside. So, the same as I am used to in my daily life, this is what I bring to the moments when I close my eyes. And the whole process of neti neti and questioning who I really am is a process of getting rid of is not adding something. And here comes, a, I feel like, a deeper question is if we can really inquire into something that we are not familiar with. Anything that we were taught or we were learned that 
we need to achieve, to gain, or to inquire to about, is usually when this our standpoint is that this is where I am, now I'm going to achieve something, I'm going to make effort to achieve it, and then when I achieve it, it's mine, I'm adding something to myself. It doesn't have to be all, always, it doesn't have to be also only with uh, material objects, yeah? Sometimes we can feel like if we are very respected, if we are very honored, we are adding to ourselves in our psychological uh, uh, patterns, we are adding to ourselves feeling that I'm important, that I'm needed, etc. And now, when we face the question of who am I, and I think, I'm going back to my memory and I'm going to the same process that I am used to. I'm going to chase something. I'm going to conquer something. I'm going to achieve it. And here comes a, not a conflict but can be a tricky point for us because it is not an object that we are running after. The self is not something. For us at the moment, it is. We, we are creating even ideas about the self. We don't know what it is. We don't know where to look. We don't know where to find it. We are trained to look and in the objective world, but we are told Hold on. It's not that you need to add something to yourself. You don't need to transform to something else. It's just to be. Be what you have been from the beginning. So it's not an object. And also, if we can think about and say, oh, this is it, it's also not that because it's a thought. And we are saying, the self is not a thought. It's not something that you can say, oh, I achieved it. Here it is. This is, this is it. It is something that lies in the depth of each one of us. And we are insisting to go and search in the objective when, where it is not an object. So this process is also requires from us doubt and not faith. Doubt because it's the first time that we are doubting who we are. And we are not required to believe something. Prabhuji directs us all the time Doubt what I say. Doubt anything that you hear. Because we are not trying to train you to be a faith, blind faith people. Or just to follow what it says without asking questions, without any curiosity. And if we look at the process that um, religious people go through, it's many times just to develop a stronger faith, which I'm not saying that there is no um, importance to it. But the point is that we are in a process of not just believing something, but to doubt, to doubt ourselves, to doubt this all egoic identity, to start to ask the question, not only who am I, who told me that I am like this? And who told me that I am like that? And why I adopted certain attributes as proudness and like that I feel proud of and why I'm, I want to get rid of other attributes and why do I really want to please people all the time and to doubt. What am I doing here? What is the purpose of our life? 
and not just to accept that we came to this world in order to uh, be educated, get married, bring kids, and uh, eventually find ourselves in the, in the grave. No, to doubt and ask, and ask the crucial questions, ask the essential questions that on the path, maybe you will hit, you know, different walls or different layers that with the practice of neti neti you can work with it because you will recognize oh this is not the self this is egoic uh, attribute this is not the real me and this is where everything comes into place so when we face the atma vicharana the inquiry into the self question we can see that it's a wholesome process, a wholesome process that of interest and curiosity, process of doubt, process of negation, that eventually when we will negate anything that is false, the self will have a the ground to be. The self will be able to manifest in us. And this is when our search will, will uh, fulfill itself. Thank you very much for joining me. Jai Prabhuji. We will meet in the next class and I hope that we will go from this one with more questions and more doubt. Thank you.